My name is Bill Swantner, and I am a certified master gardener in the state of Texas. My certification is through Texas A&M University and College Station. I belong to the Bear County Master Gardener Association. Part of our basic training as master gardeners is how to propagate plants. But the Master Gardener Association in Texas also offers advanced training in plant propagation which I was able to do. And if you are a master gardener and you'd like to uh, really improve your techniques on plant propagation, or if it's just something you're really interested in, if Tarrant County ever offers it again, uh, you need to sign up for it. I took it at Tarrant County and the folks there are absolutely incredible. It was a wonderful experience. So I'd like to welcome you to this first uh, video in a series of videos on plant propagation. And this one is kind of an introduction to the whole thing. For successful plant propagation, you need three basic things. You need to have some sort of sanitary workstation. The second thing you need to have is an understanding of the plant that you are trying to propagate. And the third thing is you need to have the tools necessary. So let's talk about the first thing, a sanitary workstation. I do my propagation outside. So the environment, we don't have much control over that. There's stuff blowing around, but we do have control over the other elements that belong, the other elements of propagation. We have control over our soil. We have a video on our Bear County Master Gardener YouTube channel done by Karen Gardner on propagation from seeds and it is absolutely i think the best thing out on how to propagate vegetables from seeds but you apply those same principles to uh, your ornamentals and she talks about how she sterilizes soil and i'm not going to touch propagation by seeds i'll simply tell you that i'll put a link up there for you to watch karen's absolutely incredible uh, presentation but she will reuse her soil and she uh, she bakes it and she sterilizes it through that way. I am assuming that when I buy a potting soil or a potting mix, that it is mostly sterile. That's an assumption I'm making. Uh, I mix a lot of my soil, so I'm assuming that the coconut core or the peat moss or the perlite or the vermiculite are sterile. I understand that I'm taking a risk introducing compost that I make at the side of my house or compost that I buy from the yards or from the nurseries, I'm accepting there may be a risk there. But for the most part, I can control how sanitary my potting medium is. Our pots that we use, we can sanitize these pots. And there are various formulations on the internet you can read about. Some people use bleach, some people use fungicide. So they use a variety of things and it's, it's pretty watered down. It's simply a matter of having a tub. And I do this at the botanical gardens. We have a wheelbarrow full of um, fungicide diluted in water. And we simply dip the, the containers in there. We set them aside and we let them dry. So we can't control the air, but we can control our soil. We can control the pots. We can control our utensils. When I was at the Botanical Gardens in Fort Worth, the people in the begonia house, and it's a fascinating, uh, beautiful collection of begonias they have, but the lady I was watching had a jar container, not this one, this is only a prop, this one's a little on the dirty side, but she had a jar container sitting on her cart, and as she was propagating, she put her utensils nose down into the, into the liquid so that as she went from begonia to begonia, as she would work on one, she put it in here so that it was constantly uh, being sterilized. Some propagators use um, sanitary uh, wipe downs, these uh, Lysol napkins or, or Mr. Clean or Clorox wipes, they use those and they wipe them down constantly. Some nursery people do that, especially as they go and they trim their bushes to make sure they don't pass disease from one bush to the next. So you can have those, uh, those wipes to help out a little bit. Paul Baumel, who's a master gardener in Bear County, uh, gave me this. This is a, a spray bottle of disinfectant. So after I do my, my cuttings or before I do my cuttings, I can simply spray this and that will help sanitize these blades
here's my towel I can wipe it down and I can go from one cutting to the next so I can control how clean my um, how clean my tools are I'll be honest with you I do not always if when I reuse my soil I do not sterilize it when I plant my vegetables my tomatoes and my cucumbers which I have growing up the hill that is fresh I buy peat moss or coconut core perlite and I have my compost and I mix my own and so that I know that it's clean but I'm I probably propagate two to three hundred plants a year uh, everything from seeds which I'll show you in, an, in another video presentation to cuttings to potting plants up and a two to three hundred I I am not going to throw away all that soil that uh, potting mix every time I, I propagate plants so I do reuse it but I pay attention to my plants if I see a plant that just doesn't look right if I see some soil that just doesn't look right or feel right or smell right I throw it out uh, but for the most part, I, I keep very careful uh, control on the soils that I use. And so the, the soil that is used, being used for tomatoes now, in the fall, I will reuse for my, uh, my ornamentals, whether it's cuttings or uh, root cuttings or, or seedlings. So I will admit that I do that. So the first thing is to have some sort of sanitary conditions. The second thing, is to have some understanding of the plant that you're working on. A book that was, uh, uh, we received as part of our training in Tarrant County was this one put out by the American Horticulture Society. It is Plant Propagation and it is an absolutely amazing book. Uh, it tells you, it takes you from the zones um, from one way up here in Canada and the nine way down here in Florida and upper parts of Mexico, 10 and 11. It talks about soil and growing medium. It talks about how to take cuttings. Uh, it talks about specific plants. Here's begonias, zinnias. They talk about the variety of plants, which way might work best because certain plants respond differently to different types of propagation. And it's important to know the plant that you're trying to propagate. Let me give you three examples of what I mean by knowing the plant that you want to propagate. This is a white plumbago. I, um, I wanted to propagate it. It's actually just right behind the camera over here to the left. And um, so I took some cuttings. I must have taken about seven or eight cuttings. And I very carefully planted them as I always did and they all died they lasted for maybe a week and they died and I couldn't figure out what happened so I thought well maybe I took some bad cuttings so I dried again um, and so I took another 10 12 cuttings and they all died and so I looked up up in the internet what how do you propagate a white plumbago and the source that I read said that if you do cuttings you have a 70% chance of die off. Well, I was doing better than that. I had a 100% chance of die off. They said, but if you can get a root cutting, not just a cutting at the tip, if you can get a root cutting, your chances of being successful uh, are, are exponentially higher. So I went to, by now, every time I showed up with a white plumbago, you heard this scream from the plant. So I took three cuttings. And this is one of them. Look how absolutely beautiful that cutting is. I originally did this cutting back in January. This is before the big freeze we had in, in Bear County in February. I took this cutting. I just recently potted it up. But I took this cutting and two others. I thought, well, I've, I've already butchered that plant. I'm not going to take a whole lot more. I'll just leave it alone. And I made three cuttings and all three of them survived. And here is that white plumbago absolutely doing incredible. When I, when I potted it up, it had a good root system. So my point is, know the plant that you're trying to propagate. Another example. I know that ferns like it, uh, like really a moist environment. So when I collected the fern spores, and I, I have a segment on fern spores coming up, and you can watch that. I knew that I had to keep this 
soil really pretty wet. So what I did was I enclosed it in a plastic bag, much as this begonia is, which I got from the people at the Botanical Gardens up in Fort Worth. And again, thank you very much, uh, Debbie Garrett. It was absolutely a wonderful trip. And I put it in here to help protect that environment, to keep that soil moist, uh, because I knew that's what ferns like. I know that's what begonias like. And so know the plant that you're planting. So I wanted to propagate some Copper Canyon daisies. And I took cuttings, I very carefully planted them in the, in the planting medium. I sealed them in a plastic bag and I put them off to the side and they looked great for about two weeks and I thought, all right. And then it was almost like day 15, they all started dying. So I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't put them in a plastic bag. So I, I cut them again. What I do is I'll put them in a six pack container, similar to this, and I'll fill it full of uh, planting medium and I'll put the cuttings in there very carefully. And um, so the first time I had them covered in a bag and they looked great. And then they started day 15, they just started dying. So I thought, well, let me do it without the plastic bag. So I got rid of that soil because I didn't want to take it as a chance. It was the potting mix. So I threw that out, got all new, put my six cuttings in here and watered them very carefully. And day one through 14, they looked great. And I thought, all right, I finally figured it out. Day 15, they just started dying one at a time. And I couldn't figure out why. I, was, I thought I was doing it correctly. Then it dawned on me the environment in which Copper Canyon daisies grow. I was watering my plants every day. The cuttings, I was watering them every day. I, the first time I had them in a plastic bag which kept the soil moist. When I watered them every day, the soil was moist. And I thought, well, let me try it again. And by this time, the Copper Canyon daisies are screaming when they see me coming like, no, 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 do some Mexican mint marigolds today. Leave the Copper Canyon daisies alone. So I did it again. But this time I made sure the soil mix that I made was a little on the drier side, not quite so much peat moss in it. And I didn't water. I watered it the first day. So let's say I put them on a Monday. Tuesday, I didn't water them. Wednesday, I watered them lightly. Thursday and Friday, I didn't water them. Saturday, I watered them again very lightly. And that was the trick. Um, I was overwatering my Copper Canyon Daisy. Now, my begonias love being watered every day. My, uh, my white plumbagos didn't mind being watered every day. But my Copper Canyon Daisy, my Mexican Mint Marigolds, my Four Nerve Daisies, my uh, blackfoot daisies these plants are used to it being dry so this is now the copper candy daisies aren't afraid of me when they see me coming but this one I uh, cut in um, the 29th of um, December again this is right before the big freeze uh, which we had in um, February and then I, I went from this to this pot on February the 3rd. And it's really time to start putting it into a little bit larger pot. So the point of these examples here and this little segment is you need to know your plant. You cannot assume that all plants will grow from seed or will give you an exact replica of the plant that you have. For example, a moy hibiscus is a hybrid. So you can get the seeds and plant them but you're more likely going to get one of the parent plants and not an exact replica of a moy hibiscus. So know the plant that you're going to propagate, whether it's by seed or by cutting or by air layering. Know the conditions in which it likes to grow, whether it's dry or moist, whether it likes sunlight or whether it needs some protection uh, in the shade, but know your plant. The third thing about even begin to propagate is to have the correct tools on hand to ensure that you'll be successful. So finally, having the correct tools. Well, as sort of recapping, the first correct tool is a sanitary workspace. If you're outside, you're gonna have things blowing through the air, but having a clean workspace, having uh, some sort of sanitation for your tools, 
The second tool is knowing the plant that you're going to propagate. But then there's the actual physical tools. I use these uh, very fine snippers because sometimes I need to get in and get just the finest little leaves cut. When I cut the, um, the, the white plumbago, I can use the larger ones. Um, but when I need to cut the finer leaves that are kind of tucked in there, or if I need to do some fine cutting like on begonia leaves, that's where I pull out the finer, the, the little snippers here. Here are some begonia cuttings that I made. Uh, when I go in and do the real fine cutting here, the cutting at the base here, and the cutting over there, I am going to use these clippers because they're very surgical. But these are just not strong enough to handle something as thick as this uh, white plumbago stem. So you have to make sure you have the right uh, clippers for, the, for the, the plant that you're going to use it on. Sometimes I will use a knife. This is an extremely sharp knife um, that I can cut down or I can sometimes when in propagating plants, you will, um, after you make your cut and you'll see it on the cutting segments, after you make the cut, you may want to scrape the uh, stem just a little bit to encourage um, root growth, st or stimulate some root growth there. And so this can be used for that. I also use this for my uh, for collecting spores, and I'll show you that uh, segment a little bit later on. So a good sharp knife, and it's a dedicated knife. I don't use this on uh, for whittling. I don't use it for cutting apples. I don't use it for cleaning my fingernails. This is a dedicated knife simply for propagation. I wipe it off before I use it just in case I forgot, and I wipe it off after I use it because I don't want anything collecting in this pouch. Um, tags. You need to have tags. Um, the tag will tell you, first off, the name of the plant. And there are times where I was in a hurry. I made a dozen cuttings and I put a tag in the first one and then a freeze came and I had to move things around and I, I recognized one of them and the other 11, I have no idea and you had to wait till they bloomed, figure out what they were. That was a lesson I learned early. So from now on, everybody gets a tag. The name of the plant is on there. If you wanna get fancy putting the Latin, that's your business. I just put down the name of the plant, Copper Canyon Daisy, uh, Begonia, Angel in Begonia. And then I put down the date that it was propagated because that kind of gives me an idea uh, when the roots will start taking place. Usually the roots will start growing in the first couple of weeks. Um, if it's a month later, two months later, and the plant looks kind of puny, if you pull it out, it may not have any roots growing. But this will tell me the name of the plant, and it will also tell me the day that I propagated it, and it will tell me the day that I potted it up. Pencil is used uh, instead of ink because many times the ink, if the sun hits it, will bake it, and you can't see what you wrote. And so the, the graphite from the pencil seems to work through all of that. Rooting hormone. Uh, this is the powder. It comes in powder. Some powders you can blend and it becomes a paste. That's what we uh, use for our master gardeners when they go through their basic training. There's a, a liquid um, rooting hormone that you can use. Some people use raw honey. I don't know. But what you do is rather than open this up and stick your entire cutting in there, because now you've contaminated the entire batch, you take what you, you take your container and you simply sprinkle a little bit into here because it really doesn't take that much. You sprinkle a little bit into here, close it up. This is when you make your, your various cutting, you put the, the, put the tip in there and you get it nice and covered uh, in that rooting hormone. So rooting hormone is part of uh, the basic tools that you need. Part of the challenge in uh, making some, some propagation through cuttings is you've got your powder or your liquid or your paste on the, on, the, on the cutting and then you insert it into the soil and it could possibly rub off as you insert it into the soil. So you need some sort of, uh, I think it's called Dremel, which is uh, really, it can be a pencil. And as you make your cutting, you put a hole into the soil and into that hole, you'll make your cutting 
and you can place it around. I use a pencil, I will use almost any. I do have a specified tool I can use for that, but many times it's just, if I have a pencil handy, the pencil works for me. But that's an important tool because as I said, you don't want to stick your, your fragile cutting very carefully covered with potty, with a rooting hormone into that soil where it might all just come right off and you essentially wasted your time. I have a plastic bag as part of my basic tools because I will do some propagation uh, ferns through spores. And so I will uh, put the spores in the plastic bag and then in time, the spores, first off, it holds the spores for me uh, in a safe place. What I can do is I can either wait for these spores to fall off into the bag or I can get these spores out and I can get my knife and I can gently rake the spores off of the leaf onto a piece of paper and I have a video clip uh, coming up another part of this series which I'll show you how I collect spores and the plants that I have grown from spores so plastic bag a small one for collecting spores you go to your aunt's house <clears throat> or your neighbor's house now this beautiful fern look on the back of it see if it has spores and ask if you can have have that limb or have a cutting of some of the leaves put them in a plastic bag take them make sure you label what the name of the fern was if there's no name of the fern that you've taken it from at least put down the date this tells me i collected uh these spores i collected it on march the third for a few because i'm not going to remember I use um, larger plastic bags. As I said earlier, this is a, uh, a begonia that when I was visiting the begonia collection at the Fort Worth Botanical Gardens, which if I haven't told you, uh, and I have, if I haven't told you, is absolutely an incredible um, collection of begonias. Debbie Garrett will take you on an absolutely magnificent tour. But this lady said, would you like to take a cutting of this red, uh, red cochineal? And I said, sure. So she gave it to me. I put it in this plastic bag. This is one of my tools that I use for cuttings. For whatever reason, whether it's my, my inexperience or my microclimate, if I leave the cuttings out, chances of them dying faster increase. I don't know if it's the heat, the wind, um, I don't know what it is. So what I do is when I make cuttings, I put them in a plastic bag or I put them with this plastic cup. Um, back when COVID hit this one place I buy, bought my morning tea from, they wouldn't give us refills. They insisted on us buying these plastic containers. And so I woke up one day, I had 50 or 60 of these things and I thought, well, what am I gonna do with them? I don't wanna throw them in the landfill. I guess I could recycle them. But then I thought to myself, I have round containers. What if I put this in here and it almost fits. I had to make a little cut in the back. This is a uh, Sam McFadden white uh, Rose of Sharon that I took to my daughter's house. I'm trying to propagate it just to see if I can. So I planted it carefully. I made sure I put my hole in there and so the rooting hormone wouldn't come off. I watered it very carefully and I put this top on here because that is going to help secure the environment for that Sam McFadden to grow. It's not guaranteed to grow, but the chances of it surviving, I have noticed in my way of working, the chances of surviving really increase. So part of my basic tools is a plastic bag and a plastic cup. Another thing that I've learned to use and rely on is a moisture meter. You look at a, uh, your, your plants and they look okay or you look at them and they look kind of dry but you don't know you're just guessing and you can't really put your finger in that little sick that little six pack because you're going to tear up all your roots i've learned to use this moisture meter the moisture meter if i put it in there and it's right now it's well there's nothing there it's, it's on red dry if i put this in my fern i know i'm in trouble because ferns like it moist if i put it in my copper canyon daisy and it says dry i know i'm doing it correctly on the other side, up to 10 is blue and it says wet. 
if I put this in my ferns and, or my begonias and it says eight or nine, then I'm in pretty good shape. If I put it in my Mexican mint marigold and it says eight or nine, I'm drowning the plant. It does not like that much moisture. So it helps take some of the guessing game out of my propagation. I use this moisture meter and it does get a little tedious when I, yes, when I propagate a hundred plants, but I can spot check and kind of give me an idea if a plant looks dry, is it really dry or is that just the appearance because of the way the soil was mixed? Uh, my little spade to help dig things up, dig nice holes in here, dig plants up. And I came across a, a, a great way to, uh, to, to dig up seeds and I'll show you that in another segment. And I use my trusty spade. This is a bulb knife. It tells you um, by inches how deep you're going so that if you want to do plant your, you want to try to plant some gladiolus or iris or you want to do some um, daffodils or you want to try to experiment with some tulips, read what the nurseries tell you how to plant them, but read the directions. But this tells you how far down you're going. But I use this primarily on my big ferns like my Boston fern and my macho ferns, oh, they're just so thick, the roots are so thick. Well, you can propagate those plants through, through spores. You can also propagate them through cuttings. So when my plants get to be a certain size, I'll bring them up here on my soil table that I built, and I will use a serrated edge, and I'll just start cutting through because it does an incredible job. And I can take one 16-inch uh, macho uh, fern or Boston uh, fern and I could turn it easily into four smaller ferns put them in a larger pot and let or put them in their own pot and let them start growing now on their own so instead of having one fern I now have four but this is important for for bulbs and for cutting those plants like ferns a rag uh, for wiping down your tools in between use. Sometimes wiping up another rag for wiping down my hands sometimes because it gets a little messy out here, but having a clean rag, not the, the, ra the rag that, that somebody changed the oil of the car in last week and it's got oil uh, residue all over it, but a clean rag, almost a dedicated rag for your area in your propagation. And then the last thing I say is to make sure you have the pot that you need. Well, the master gardeners of Bear County are taught propagation. Luke Kellogg uh, is the instructor and does just absolutely an incredible job. He has them use this bulb planter and we fill it full of uh, the, the soil, so the mix, and uh, it's moistened. And then they, as they make their cuttings, the, the interns make their cuttings, they place them in here with their tags, reminding them what they, what they, what they, what they planted there. And then this middle area is, is this little tiny cup. It is real wax at the bottom. And that cup is filled. And that cup will slowly ooze out water and water the area around so it's not over water. So, this is, uh, so make sure you have the right pot for what you want to do. If you want to use this type of propagation for growing your, your cuttings, great. Uh, I use round pots and I use square pots. Uh, no rhyme, no reason. Uh, I use the round, I like the round pots because this cup fits on there really very nicely. I like the square pots because I can line them up inside the container. The holding container is a lot easier and I, and this, I, can, I can get more in there because the round pots, they've got, they've got spaces between them. So, recapping, before you propagate your first plant, Get a good, safe, somewhat sterile environment. If it's outside, that's a chance you have to take. But the soil that you're using, the pots that you're using, the tools that you're using. Remember this, if you're gonna make cuttings, this thing is gonna cut into the vascular system of the plant. If there's a pathogen on here, you are introducing that into the vascular system of the plant. It's just like if I had uh, like a typhoid, typhus, on here and I cut into my arm I am introducing that into my arm so make sure that you have 
a sanitary as much as you can get it condition. Make sure your pots are clean, your soil's clean, make sure your tools are clean, you have a clean workspace. Second thing, know your plants. The book by the Horticulture Society. There's another, go to Lady Bird Johnson uh, Nature Area Wildlife Center in Austin. They have a link where you click on plants and that is absolutely an incredible source for you resource for you to go to and look up the plants that you want to propagate and see what they tell you see where it grows is it a warm plant is is it like dry does it like it wet does it like it warm does it like it cool and then as you make those cuttings try to copy that environment so know your plant and then finally the third thing is make sure that you have the tools if you're going to make a bunch of cuttings of begonias and copper canning daisies you really don't need uh, this knife from Crocodile Dundee. But if you're going to do bulb cuttings, this little guy's not gonna help you out a whole lot. So know the plant that you're going to propagate. Make sure you have the correct tools. So this is the introduction. In the video series and the clip segments after this, I will show you various ways of plant propagation some of them I will do, some of them I will show you what other people have done, and it's absolutely extraordinary. So I hope you learned something, and I hope you're enjoying this here. If you have any questions about this video, please call our Bear County Master Gardener helpline. If you'd like more information about the Bear County Master Gardeners Association, please look at our website. And if you'd like to know more about the Texas Master Gardener Association, then please look at their website.